good evening. Thank you for being here with us. I'd like to introduce uh, actually two friends and people that I really admire and respect. First, the ladies. Of course, Muna Tahawi, who's very well known, and uh, she's a columnist that writes about the Arab Revolution, women's issue, and Islamic issues. And uh, a great writer, I should say. I read his book when I was a teenager, and I fell in love with his words. Um, and uh, of course, you all can find the book. It's Babi Shams. It's the, the Gate of the Sun, Elias Khoury. And um, let's start. And uh, whoever knows me knows that um, I'm controversial, of course. And I go to the point, and I don't think we here at this festival, we don't have to hide behind politeness or political correctness. Let's go really and start to understand from Mona and, and from Elias what's going on in the region. And if this, and it starts immediately with Mona, how do you see, I mean, we were all hopeful about this Arab Spring and all of us who were born in that region and of course lived all over the world because we couldn't live in our countries because our words were more dangerous than a gun. We had to leave most of us dissident and free thinkers, intellectuals. How do you see the revolution and where it's heading today? Good evening, everyone. I'd like to thank Penn and the World Festival for having this event on Egypt and the revolution. And I'd like to thank you, Rula, for the kind introduction. I think when you look at Egypt, you can look at Egypt at what's happening on the ground right now, which is quite miserable because lots of people have been killed outside of the Ministry of Defense over the past few days. And you can get caught up in, in those daily death tolls, which are incredibly heartbreaking because we're talking about a lot of young people who are being killed. And um, there's a lot of uncertainty over the role that the military junta is playing and whether it's playing a role in these deaths and uh, its dereliction of duty, essentially, because it, it runs the country right now. And it's clearly unable or unwilling to protect Egyptians. So you can get caught up in the day-to-day -day events, or you can take a more of a bird's eye view and understand that as heartbreaking as these events on the ground are, it's only 16 or 17 months after we got rid of Hosni Mubarak. And while we got rid of Mubarak himself, we didn't fully get rid of the regime. We ended up basically replacing one Hosni Mubarak with 19 military generals, 19 Hosni Mubaraks, basically, his friends from the military. And they comprise the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces. So it's only been 16 or 17 months. And so it's, it's to be expected as, as uh, heartbreaking and as uh, horrifying as it is to watch these deaths that happen every three or four months now in Egypt. We lose so many people as part of the revolution. But again, it, it's the sad reality of what a revolution means and what it means to fully get rid of a regime, because this is ultimately our goal in Egypt, to be ruled or represented rather by civilians and not ruled by the military and we've been ruled by men from the military in Egypt since 1952. So I urge you to take that more of a macro perspective and look at Egypt as a country that is struggling to create a reality on the ground that for 60 years we've been denied from creating but at the same time it's the most exciting time of our lives because when you lift a lid like that you get beautiful things that come up, and that is Egyptians saying, we will hold everyone accountable, and that makes it incredibly exciting. It's the most exciting time of my life. But you also get a lot of ugliness that comes up, and that's the military junta, and people who don't fully believe in, in the, the people's right to hold our representatives accountable. But we're fighting, and I'm, I'm fully convinced that we will win. Thank you, Muna. And, and uh, let's remember just some facts um, a year ago, more or less, the revolution started Tunisia, then Egypt, and Egypt we were all really, not only excited, more than excited, because Egypt represented for the rest of the Arab world a place where culture, movies, music came from, uh, intellectuals, ideas. And um, then, weeks after, Mubarak was not there, and we were really hopeful. The election were held, and I want to ask Elias Khoury and the Muslim brothers and the Salafists won this election. And today we're, you know, they're running actually, um, some people are running and there will be a presidential election. Are you hopeful about these elections? No, for, uh, <coughs> uh, good evening everybody, thank you Rula. Uh, first of all, I am very hopeful. Uh, not about the elections, but I am very hopeful about the destiny of the region. 
This region, uh, since Tuni Tunisia and then Egypt and then Yemen and now Syria and uh, Bahrain and Libya and hopefully, uh, hopefully it will arrive in the end to the Gulf and we'll finish from this uh, terrible, uh, terrible kings and uh, and uh, and oil uh, sheikhs that destroyed their societies and our societies. I think it's a great way. It was it was a, a big surprise for us, and it taught us first of all to be humble. Intellectuals like me must uh, be humble and must learn from the young generation. There is a new generation that began something very courageous, very inspiring, and if we have a role, our role is to be with them and not to teach them. Our role is to learn from them and to work with them. And this is the first lesson I got from, from this major wave, big wave of revolutions. The second thing, if someone was expecting that Hosni Barak will fall down and tomorrow there will be democracy, then he is thinking of the terms of the old ways of analysis. He is thinking of the terms of a coup d'etat. This is not a coup d'etat. This is a, a revolution, and the revolution is a huge process, a huge historical process. These are societies that were, since 60 years, under military control. Since 60 years, there was no civil society. The civil society was destroyed systematically by the regime. And what's coming out now is the normal thing. Uh, now, if you analyze the Egyptian situation, I think the Egyptian situation will have three big forces. We have, first of all, the military uh, junta that is trying to keep power in its hands and uh, trying to make from the revolution a type of a coup d'etat in one way or another, that is to steal the revolution. And the second big power are the <coughs> Islamists, who actually were the major opposition out of the regime after the regime succeeded in destroying the left, uh, the left movements and who were anywhere or another part of the regime in the sense that they were, uh, uh, they had in a way the control over, not a control, but a big hand over culture. And we remember from Najib Mahfouz's, he was, how he was stabbed, stabbed by a fundamentalist, to Nasser Hamid Abu Zaid, to all the intellectuals who were under big persecutions by the Islamists. So the second power are the Islamists, and the third power is Midan al-Tahrir, is the Tahrir Square, are the young people of the revolution. <laughs> now, uh, the elections came and it showed that uh, the young people of the, of the revolution were not well organized, couldn't, uh, couldn't uh, play a major role in the, in the parliamentary elections. But nonetheless, I think there is equilibrium and equilibrium in this triangle. And this is the issue. And, and two of the forces of this triangle are obligatory have to, to make an alliance. We were frightened from the idea that the Islamists and the military junta will make an alliance, and there were a big signs of that. Now these signs are no more. I think that we have to impose a, a civil alliance on the, on the Islamists. It will be a very tough work, uh, but without this alliance, we cannot proceed to finish the military, the military regime. Now, one must take into consideration that when we speak about Islamists, we are not speaking about one block. The Islamists have many, many, many problems inside. The young people of the Muslim Brotherhood uh, have their point of view, which is different from the old guard. There is an Islamist uh, presidential candidate, uh, Abu Futuh, who was a member of the Brotherhood and who left the Brotherhood. And now it seems he is the first runner in the election. So things are very complicated. But we must put in mind that there is a necessity of creating a civil alliance. And this will be very tough. It must be imposed, actually, upon the Islamists, because the Islamists will not like it very much. But this is the only way to get rid of the junta. And then the uh, democratic process can move. I would like to include uh, Mona in the conversation. Do you agree on this analysis that we have to make an alliance with Islamists? I mean, coming from a very, very far point of view, uh, you know, the, the liberals like us, 
to be seated or to even start negotiating or talking to the Islamists would be very difficult. And I'm talking about simple issues, even women's rights. I mean, let's start from that. Mm -hmm. And I would like to show all of you, of course, this beautiful cover of foreign, foreign policy where, where Muna is writing these amazing articles. Why, and the title is, why do they hate us? Hate us <laughs> men in Egypt, Islamists, especially hate women, especially that looks like Muna and myself. Um, Muna. <laughs> Where do I begin? <laughs> <laughs> From the beginning of <laughs> How much time do you have? <laughs> no, um, look, clearly on the ground, the Muslim Brotherhood and the Muslim Brotherhood and the Salafis, I mean, as Ilyas said, they are not a monolithic bloc. Under the Mubarak regime, Mubarak was very adept at playing up, playing the Muslim Brotherhood against the Salafis. So internally, when you look at the big Islamist bloc, there are divisions, they are different. There are differences in ideology, there are differences in the way they approach politics, and it's been especially uh, frustrating to see the Salafis, who control 25% of parliament, embrace, and maybe this is a good thing, embrace politics so vehemently when for such a long time they believed the democratic process itself was a sin. So what you're seeing essentially is the people who are the most prepared on the ground. Under the Mubarak regime, they did not close the mosques. And so people who use religion as a pulpit for both faith and politics clearly were the ones far ahead. And that's one of the many reasons that the Islamists control so many seats in parliament. When the, was, in the case of the Muslim Brotherhood, they also were a charitable organization that provided a lot of social services that the Mubarak regime neglected to provide for people on the ground. So there are many reasons that they did so well. The Salafis went out giving meat and much needed uh, commodities in certain cities across Egypt. And when you have a very poor population and you're given meat to vote for someone, you will vote for them. So it's a very complicated picture. It's not just about Egyptians want Islamist parties. Egyptians are very religious. Egyptians want uh, this complicated mix of religion and politics. Some Egyptians do. But when you look at polls that have asked people to look at the way the Islamists have performed in parliament, at least 45% of Egyptians who do not belong to the Muslim Brotherhood movement say they will not vote for them again. And why? Because the main concerns of most Egyptians are job creation for young people, unemployment among the youth in Egypt is sky high, fixing the economy because our foreign reserves are very, very low and our, our economy has taken a big blow. One of the main reasons is because tourism has almost completely disappeared. So I urge you to visit Egypt. It is safe. Just don't go to the Ministry of Defense. <laughs> Leave that to us, OK? And, and, and the third thing Egyptians wanted to be fixed was actual security on the ground. Because for one reason or another, the police is not interested in protecting Egyptians. Because for a very long time, the Ministry of the Interior's job was to protect the regime. The Ministry of the Interior broke my arms and sexually assaulted me, as they did with many other Egyptians involved in the revolution. Having taken all of that into account, and you look at what the Islamists have done in parliament, I often compare it to the Christian coalition here. I often tell American audiences so that you can understand what's happening in Egypt. You have a Christian brotherhood here. The Christian brotherhood is represented by men like Rick Santorum. Here is your, he is your American Salafi. He, just like the Muslim brotherhood in Egypt, are obsessed with my vagina. They're obsessed with sex. They're obsessed with women. They're obsessed with controlling women and women's sexuality. So you have the Republican so-called war led war on women here, and I wrote in foreign policy about the war on women in the region. But the war on women in the region that I mentioned is launched not just by the Islamists, because we've been under these nominally secular regimes for such a long time that have not been interested in women's rights. And so my concern when people talk about alliances with, with the Islamists is that women will be the cheapest bargaining chip. Because when you sit down with the Islamists, they are very literal in their interpretation of religion just like the Christian coalition here is very literal in its interpretation of Christianity. And so when you talk about women's rights, it's often the first thing to be thrown out of the window because unfortunately we're very cheap commodities when, when it comes to political negotiation. And so I am willing to sit and talk to an Islamist who cares about the revolution. And when it comes to the young and the old of the Muslim Brotherhood, two weeks into the Muslim Brotherhood, basically moving into 50% of parliament, that distinction between the young and old faded. Because even though it was the, the youth of the Muslim Brotherhood, along with the football fans known as the soccer fans, known as the ultras, who protected Tahrir Square from police brutality, the youth of the Muslim Brotherhood were standing outside of parliament and beating revolutionaries two weeks after parliament began. So you have to look at the Muslim Brotherhood as a very disciplined movement. And I'm very glad that they are now being challenged politically, because when you're an ideology and you have a political party, the politics will ruin you. And so as far as I'm concerned, this is the beginning of the end 
of the Islamists in Egypt. So you, you predict that they will fail? They will fail because they will have to make political alliances that will taint them. And somewhere along the line, you have to decide, am I an ideology or a political party? And so I'm glad that the Muslim Brotherhood is unable to create jobs. Obviously, I want them to create jobs, but they've shown Egyptians that they have no they have political the backbone. So we need that, yes, we need the alliances, but we need them also to be alliances that are not built on my back, that alliances that do not sacrifice me in order for the Islamists to talk to us. I, I think we all agree on this. Um, Ilyas, uh, I met actually the candidate president uh, for the, the ex-Muslim brothers uh, and in, uh, in Jordan, 2006. And on my question, when I asked him, if you for, uh, it was impossible, the scenario was impossible, and I asked him, would you relinquish power if you would be elected one day? If one day you would be a president or prime minister, and four years after, people would not vote for you, will you relinquish power? It took him, I think, 12 minutes to answer, and the answer was not no. The answer was, we will see, depends on the people. I said, if will people will vote no for you, would you relinquish power? And he kept on saying, I, I, we will see, and I, I said, I'm sorry, I need an answer, yes or no. He couldn't answer me. When, when did this happen? 2006 in Jordan. Yeah, it's very long time ago. Uh, the thing is, the thing is really, uh, I'm, not, I'm not trying to defend the Islamists at all. I'm a very secular, uh, I, I'm an, first I'm an atheist, and uh, I'm secular, and I'm, my struggle since uh, uh, I was very young, and is continuing, is a struggle for a secular democratic society. Just to be clear. Now, uh, the second thing is what you have to take into consideration that there is a revolution in the making and things are changing. Uh, this Muslim Brotherhood leader in 2006, of course he will say no because thinking of taking power, the, taking, the way of taking power in those days were not, would not have been in his imaginary the outcome of a popular democratic revolution. I don't think anybody, this is why the military junta in Egypt, who have all the power and have all this army with all its, its, its uh, uh, economic influence in Egypt, they, they control actually one third of the Egyptian economy, the, 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 the army. They cannot rule. Why they cannot well, obviously rule? Obviously, the pyramid of power is turned upside down. But Before it was one man controlling the rest, now it's totally the but they cannot rule. They cannot rule because people are in the streets because people are in a revolutionary process. So we have to, to, to adjust ourselves to, to this process, which is a very complicated process. I'm not saying that the Islamists tomorrow will become democrats. They will not. But we have to push, to push to impose real politics instead of politics of identity. So you the, the, Islamists, the Islamists, sorry. The Islamists yes. won the elections. You're confident won the, that they are capable of changing? No, no, no. They will no. have to impose change on the How? discourse because the discourse, they won the elections for many reasons that uh, Muna spoke about. But one of the major things that they were able to make the, 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 uh, the campaign, a campaign of politics of identity instead of politics of programs. So you have to push towards another type of politics, which they are obliged to push now, because they are now uh, the majority in the parliament. So pushing things this way doesn't mean that <coughs> tomorrow they will become democrats. They will never become democrats. And, and first of all, we have to get rid of the military junta, and that, uh, then our real battle will begin. And our real battle will begin in order to create a democratic, secular society where we have equality, total okay. equality, so and where women uh, 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 will be totally free and will not, nothing will be on their so backs. And not only the Muslim Brotherhood uh, are against women. These regimes, yeah. Yeah. we speak yeah. about Hussein Barak was secular. What does that mean? This, this was only a military fascist regime. And, and, and the problem, and one of the major fail, our failures, to speak to, we have to be, we have to be uh, honest with ourselves. In the intellectual li Egyptian life, there was a big tendency inside the Egyptian intellectual life to, to make this formula. We have to be allied to the dictator because we are afraid from the Islamists. And I think this was the major error which, which destroyed our credibility in society. And, 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 and people like the last minister of, of culture under Mubarak, 
Dr. Jabir Asfour, who is a very big Arab intellectual uh, and, and, and who, who wrote many books about, about enlightenment. For enlightenment for him meant to work under, not under Hussein Barak, but under Suzanne Barak, to, to, be, to be under his wife, to make culture a part of the court of Mrs. Mubarak. So this is a big error which we are paying its price now, and we have, we have to be honest. Now, the thing is, what we need now, in Egypt or elsewhere, is to get rid of the military junta. What, what, what will not happen in Syria, because in Syria, the, the Syrian army is totally structured uh, like the North Korean army, so we will not have a military junta. The revolution will take longer, but it will finish by finishing this, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, terrible apparatus of, of oppression, hopefully. I, I need to ask Muna about the, the, the military junta, the SCAF, what they call themselves. Uh, I mean, we're talking about people that they don't want to be prosecuted. Mm -hmm. They saw Mubarak being uh, prosecuted uh, in, 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 um, in court for the first time. It's uh, one of the most moving, I remember, phone calls of my family was when, when my aunt called me and she said, I cannot believe it. I'm watching Mubarak in, 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 in a cage. I, she said, you know, I cannot believe it. He's even playing with his, na with his nose. He's, I, I mean, the guy, you couldn't even say in Egypt that he was sick. They would arrest you if you would write that he was ill. So to see him, it was a historical thing. So I think they, were, they are scared of that, and they are scared. They don't want anybody to put their nose in their business, in their economic arrangements. Mm -hmm. Do you think it, when we will get rid of them, and if we will, we will get rid of them? Right. No, th those are exactly the two points that concern them the most, basically to immunity from trial. Because don't forget also that the, the military junta promised Mubarak, basically, that he would be free from trial, which is why after he stepped down on February the 11th, he was forced to step down, he basically went on vacation. Mm -hmm. He went to Sinai. And all Egyptians were saying, why is this guy in Sinai in his beach house? It's because the military junta told him, you're going to be fine. He didn't flee the country because he was guaranteed that he would be fine. But why was he put on trial? Because of street pressure. Because the people demanded that he be put on trial. So the military junta understands very well the people's power. And the military junta's main concern is that whoever becomes our president, if and when, and I, still, I say if because it's still unclear that we will have presidential elections on May the 23rd and the 24th. If and when we have presidential elections, the, the last thing the military wants is a president who then turns around to the military junta and says, the street is pressuring me into putting you on trial, and you understand what that means because you were pressured by the street to put Mubarak on trial. And so when you look at the, the, the presidential elections that are coming up, and the conspiracy theories flying around on them, because no one is certain what's happening, the military junta is either Machiavellian in its genius, mm -hmm. in, in its way to disqualify two Islamist candidates and a regime candidate, as it did a couple of weeks ago. And so everyone thinks, are they trying to be fair? What are they trying to do? Or it doesn't know what the heck it's doing, and it's just basically trying to catch up with what's happening on the street. The truth probably lies somewhere in the middle. But when you look at other countries that have struggled with not just military hunters, but military hunters that are US funded, because the Egyptian military receives $1.3 billion in aid from the United States every year, and Congress, had wanted to make that aid conditional, and then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton insisted that that military aid continue to the military junta. Because, as we've seen with five US administrations, the main concern of the US administration when it comes to Egypt, which is a huge ally, is this mythical word stability. And stability has always come at our expense, the people in Egypt, and what the revolution is saying is the stability must come from the people and not from this one man ruling us. So unfortunately, our tax dollars continue to go to the military junta. But when I look at other military juntas that were US funded, eventually they did disappear. It took Latin America a few years, but it's a different world now. Things happen much faster now. So it's not gonna take us the 20 years maybe that it took Brazil to put its military junta on trial. In Egypt, it might take us 10, but I will take that. Because in Egypt, I am looking ahead to the next five to 10 years, because we will need five to 10 years to build the structures and institutions that the military have so far denied us in Egypt. Uh, Ilyas, I would like to ask you, you know, that everybody is looking when the Islamists were elected, of course we all know that they will be elected because of their strong base and because of the social work that they did, and also because they control three things. Wherever they are, they control three things always, media, social work, 
uh, which is charity and other things, and uh, medical services. And in this case, do you think are they? Do you think they are going to marry the model of Turkey? Are they looking towards Turkey or towards Iran? Which is the model that they will? Do you think will 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 go? To? Really, really, I don't know if they have a model. I, I think they are now in a in a very uh, critical moment uh, because uh, you have, if you, if you look at the structure, you have the Muslim Brotherhood, and then you have the party of the Muslim Brotherhood. There are two different things, and, and we, nobody knows the, the limits between them. The second thing, inside the Brotherhood, since its beginning, there were two lines. The line of Al-Banna and the line of Qutub, Sayyid Qutub. And all the leadership of the Brotherhood now are, were the friends of Sayyid Qutub, who was, who was uh, hanged by, by Nasser in 1954. So, but the tendency of Ibanna, which is a more, uh, a more democratic, let's say, a more open-minded tendency, is still there and very powerful. S and, and, and you know, uh, Islamism in the region began with the Muslim Brotherhood. They were long before Turkey, they were the model. So I don't think the issue is looking which model they go. Of course, they cannot go to the Iranian model because they are not Shiites, and the Iranian model is, is related to the, to the new formula of Shiite Fuqah that Khomeini fabricated, which is the Wilayat uh, uh, al which has nothing to do with the traditional Shiite uh, Fuqah, but nonetheless, so the Iran is out of question. Turkey may be, but also Turkey is different from them. And I think they are trying to, form, to make their own formula, which will take them a long time, and which will be a very complicated process. But, but the, the major thing which we are, we are seeing now is that, first of all, the Muslim Brotherhood, the Islamists did not join the revolution in the beginning. They were obliged to join the revolution. The Salafists did not join the revolution at all. They don't believe in the revolution. No, no, they are, the Salafists were all the time with the, with the, with the Mukhabarat, with the, with the secret, secret service, service of Mubarak. Second, when they joined the revolution, they tried to make the alliance with the military junta. And it was very clear. And it also didn't work. So they are just trying to find their way. Now, just one, one remark about the, the $1.3 billion of the American aid. Yes. You know, America gave aid not only to Egypt, gave aid now, to, uh, it was after the Camp David, $1.3 billion to Egypt and $3 billion to Israel, Israel. for military aid. Now, the Israelis, the, uh, the Israeli army used them uh, like armies, that is to kill. Because they, they continue killing the Palestinians. Whereas, uh, and to make their job as, a, as, a, an, army, as an army of occupation. Whereas the Egyptian army is given $1.3 billion in order not to be an army, in order not to fight. You know, it's, it's very, very interesting. And uh, this is why the Americans are so frightened they want to continue paying, because this is they are paying uh, to, to secure Israel in order that the Egyptian army will not be an army. This is why the Egyptian army has all this uh, empire, economic empire in Egypt. And they are afraid not not to go to trial only. They are afraid for their economic empire. And they want the president, the elected president, to be clear that he will not touch all the sector, which is, nobody knows what it is. It's Alibaba's uh, cave. <laughs> nobody knows what, what is there. I mean, nobody knows. So, so, so as you see, the problematic is very, very complex. And, and this is what they tried to put in the Constitution also, immunity and, and, it, didn't and, the and it, it, it didn't work and it cannot work. So they don't know. so the military most probably don't know what they want to do. And they are totally lost. The Islamists also don't know what they want to do. And more than that, the liberals don't know what they want to do. Yeah. And the, the leftists, everybody they, this is one this is a very strange situation. This is a revolution without a text. Normally, normally you have a referential text in all revolutions. This revolution came out from nowhere, from this deep feeling of dignity. This is a revolution of dignity. People cannot take it anymore. So, and, and now, when we look at it, we as intellectuals, we are uh, uh, adopted to, 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 to our classical ways of analysis. We see it's chaotic. And it is chaotic in a way, but but I think this is freedom. We have to build a new text. And the new text will be built 
in the revolutionary process itself. And I think this is the most interesting thing which is taking place. Now, it can be very, uh, it can be uh, sad what's going on in Egypt, uh, the killings is very sad, but yeah, I mean, co to compare it with Syria, then you must feel very good because because what's going on in Syria with this, uh, with this, uh, with this uh, savagery, unprecedented savagery of the, of the, of the Ba'ath regime of Syria, uh, 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 it, it makes it very tough. But in the end, being it tough or being it smoother like the Egyptian way, because the Egyptians are, are, are nicer, uh, uh, they, they, uh, they tell jokes all the time. You know, the revolution, during the revolution, I mean, Everybody were on the internet following them, and and there was more sexual harassment in three weeks of revolution than in the entire history. Okay, okay. I mean, okay, there were a lot of things. There were a lot of things. I agree to that, and and and, and the military. And, but but we must we must be very uh, 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 proud of this young uh, 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 woman who was taken to this uh, uh, virginity. Yeah, Samira Ibrahim. Yeah, Samira Ibrahim. I think I think Samira Ibrahim is a real hero of the of the Egyptian revolution and 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 uh, because she refused to to shut to, sh to shut up she took them to court she will she won first then she lost and now she's continuing her battle this is this is the, the our battle that is this is not only the battle of the freedom of women the freedom of women in any society is the criteria is the criterion of the freedom of society itself Absolutely. Can I say something real quick yes, in reaction to what Elias said? Uh, you know what you said about um, US money going to the Egyptian army so that it doesn't act like an army? No, no, it acts like an army against us, the people of Egypt. That's who the Egyptian army fight, basically. That's where. So basically, all, all this tax, our tax dollars go to the Egyptian army to buy American weapons that then they use against us on the streets in Egypt. That's what's happening. But the, the Turkish thing, you know, Erdogan, the, the Turkish prime minister, came to Egypt and he is beloved by the Muslim Brotherhood because for them he is a huge hero because for them he is their dream come true but this is this is by way of explaining to you how far apart Egypt and Turkey is Erdogan came to Egypt and spoke at the Opera House and he was received like a hero by the Muslim Brotherhood and then he got up and he said something that was very puzzling to them he said to them you must create a secular state in Egypt and they were totally stumped because here is their hero from an Islamist background but not ruling Turkey as an Islamist. Ruling a secular country from an Islamist background, but not as an Islamist. And they just could not get their head around that. Because in Egypt, to this day, the word secular means atheist. We don't have a word that, it's a pejorative word. We don't have it in the public discourse as meaning secular, i.e. religion is at home, and in the public life, and in the public discourse, and the political discourse, it's secular, and nothing to do with God and religion. And the last thing about what you said, Elias, about um, the intellectuals and their struggle to keep up. I love this point because I think whether it comes to talking about what's happening on the ground and how so many academics, I mean, and so many family members of mine are from academia, but I love to bash academia regardless. <laughs> so many academics did not see this coming. And they did not see the revolutions coming because they this ridiculous notion of Arab exceptionalism. They would tell you the Nile is a very docile river. It runs very slowly. And it, so it's created a very passive population in Egypt. And they do not rise up because they love their pharaoh. And I always tell them, no, we don't love our pharaoh. You love our pharaoh. Five US presidents loved our pharaohs. We don't love our pharaoh. And so you had this idea that Arabs were somehow a different alien form who loved their Saddams and their Mubaraks and their Gaddafis, who were all supported, by the way, by the West, not because we wanted them. And so academia is having a really hard time right now catching up. It's basically telling the people on the ground Slow down until we create a theory for you. And the people on the ground are saying, you know what? When you're ready to catch up with us, catch up with us and we'll talk to you. Because when it comes to everything, Orientalism, may Edward Said rest in peace. But if Edward Said was alive today, he would have, cre he would have, he would have done Orientalism 2.0, 3.0. It's a different time now. And academics are stuck in post-colonial, Oriental, I don't know what. And the people on the ground are saying, you're too slow for me. When you're ready to catch up, we will talk. Beautiful. I, I think now we can actually switch and talk about uh, United States policies towards Egypt and what they're doing, and also in, in regards to Israel, because obviously, you know, Egypt is a big force, 80 million people, but you know, 90 today. 90 today, and tomorrow the main neighbor. Say, tomorrow is 95. 95 tomorrow morning. <laughs> We're a very poor country. We don't have a lot to do. You know, there's 
And this is a country that the United States, and especially the Congress, is guarding like uh, the best alive, and not only as if it's another state. Um, and I remember, you know, one of the concerns of the U.S. Uh, administration, and they were fumbling in the beginning of that. You know, we, we all remember Hillary Clinton saying, "Oh, Mubarak is stable," and and this and that. And they, you know, they also had to catch up with the people. Uh, but I remember also something else. I remember being in Israel, making interviews, and suddenly they used to say, oh, it's, oh, we don't have any partners in the region because we are the only democracy. But suddenly they were scared of that movement of democracy. Um, how do you see them today and the reaction of the, or also the policy to, of the US administration and regarding Israel and regarding uh, working with the Islamists? The Islamists have been here a while ago visiting. Okay. No, you're absolutely right, Rona. The, the U.S. administration has struggled to catch up with what, the, again, with the reality on the ground. Unfortunately, the U.S. administration and much of the Western media would always focus on Mubarak when Mubarak was in power. And now that it's the Muslim Brotherhood, it's, it's like, take me to your leader theory. Whoever's in power, we will talk to. And they rarely focus on anybody else. And so when the Muslim Brotherhood sent the, the prettiest and the youngest and the brightest to basically court Washington and the Council on Foreign Relations and others, they were feted in various places as, you know, okay, the, the, the new rulers of Egypt, and we, and you know what, they're a bit, it's like small beard is better than big beard. Because at the time, we had the Salafi guy who wanted to run for president, who ironically enough was disqualified because the Salafis themselves pushed for a xenophobic law that would outlaw and disqualify anyone who's related to a foreign national, and he somehow forgot his mother was a US citizen. Not really sure how that happened. And so when the Muslim Brotherhood were in DC, they got the, the, the open support of the administration which said, we actually support the Muslim Brotherhood candidate for president because he's much better than the other guy, because the other guy was virulently anti-American. Anyway, so the Brotherhood were not challenged on women's rights, Christian rights, <coughs> any kind of minority rights because they sent these very cute young people who spoke English fluently and told everybody everything is just fine. And clearly it's not fine because Egyptians on the ground are struggling mightily with the idea of how do we avoid the tyranny of the majority. You might be the majority in parliament, but what about the rights of the rest of us? Mm -hmm. So the administration is struggling there. It doesn't know what to do because it's not used to talking to more than one person. And they need to start talking to more than one person. When it comes to Israel, th this, is, this is utterly bizarre for me. And I reported, I was based in Jerusalem for about 13 months with Reuters news agency. Israel always likes to pride itself as the only democracy in the region. But take into account that that democracy is not a full democracy for the Palestinian citizens of Israel because they are not treated in the way that Israel's Jewish citizens are treated. But nevertheless, it says we're the only democracy in the region. And yet, when the revolutions began and we, the rest of the region, were trying to become democratic, the Israelis were complaining that they were losing their partners. So my question to the Israelis is, how as a democracy is your partner a dictator and you're happy with that? Because your, again, your stability must not depend on a dictator who sold you natural, uh, Egypt's natural gas at a, much, uh, a price much lower than market value, and that essentially reduced the role of Egypt as the border guard of Gaza. That is not a true partner. If you want to be true partners with the Egyptian people, acknowledge our, our struggle for freedom and dignity. So this is something that is truly befuddling to me, that the Israeli government, while on, at the same time as, as priding itself on being a democracy, wants its partners to be dictators. And at the end of the day, quite honestly, these revolutions have nothing to do with Israel. These revolutions are about freedom and dignity, which we will achieve. And Israel has to, be, has to get used to this idea that we will be free. And it has to be at peace with the people who are free, including the Palestinians that it occupies. Elias, uh, one of the things that... I don't agree at all. You don't Just agree, so please. No, I, 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 first, first, I think Israel knows what, what she is doing. They are not stupid. They want dictators, I said. They want dictators because they are an occupation. And it is an apartheid uh, society. And, and, and if, you are, if you are occupier, if you treat your citizens the, uh, the Palestinian citizens in your in their in, in their country, no, no. But, so they know what they are doing first, S and 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 when they were frightened from democracy because they know that democracy means that Israel cannot continue this politics in the region, this politics of domination, this politics of of humiliation of of, of the Palestinians, 
this, politic, uh, this politics of the war, this politics of appropriating the Palestinian land, and so on and so forth. They know this very well. Even if the revolutions do not have uh, uh, nationalistic slogans, but they know any, any democratic government in any Arab country will be asked what's going on in, in Palestine. How can we tolerate the way the Palestinians are treated under occupation? So the Israelis know very well, and the Israelis, by definition, are against democracy. It's not stupidity. Now, the Americans is a more problematic story because, unfortunately, the American, what the American uh, strategy yeah, here. Let me stop you one okay. second. Are you saying that the Israelis are by nature anti. I mean, not. Uh, no, not by nature. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm saying no, that. No, there's uh, nothing by nature. I'm thinking about the Israeli government. I'm ah, the government. That. Okay, please. Uh, so the people, the people, no, the people is different. I mean, the no, people no, no, are no, like no, any no. people of her. You mean the government of Netanyahu? Not, not, all, not only the government of Netanyahu, the political structure of occupation. Okay. And occupation was not made by Netanyahu, occupation was made by the Labour Party. So the so just the establishment, the government. No, no, no. There is history, the occupation yes. of the West Bank. I'm not speaking about the occupation of Palestine in 1948, which is also another crime against humanity, which is also another story, uh, and it was done by by, by the Labour Party, the the, Isra the Israeli political establishment, that is insisting on this politics of occupation, must be with the dictators, because they are alike. Even if they are democratic, you cannot you cannot be a democracy. When, when, when you occupy another nation... I, I think you both and, agree on the fact that, uh, you know... Uh, no, no, but, but it's, not, it's not a misunderstanding. Israel towards the Palestinians it's, it's, and the it's not, mis it's not only a misunderstanding, it's a structural No, I think problem. you agree. No, no, I think okay. you agree. So let's switch to, to the, to the uh, Western, actually, attitude. And I should say that before, and Muna is really right, before the Arab Revolution, wherever he would go, even inside the United Nations, so, you know, I'm not sure that Arabs are compatible with democracy, you know, just... They would look down at us, like if we're a bunch of Bedouins, um, backwards. Uh, just they are not fit to be a democratic, to have a democratic system in their country. But the Arab Revolution changed something in the mindset of the West. Do you think so? Or I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> no, no, I hope so. I hope so because because you. But know, do you think? Do you feel that no, no, you're more respected? No, 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 no. I mean, I really. No, no. In the, in the process. You tell me. No. In the process, what Muna said was is totally right. They are waiting someone to come and say, tell them we are govern Egypt now to make make a deal with us, and and, and they will be happy even if if he is a new a new phase of dictatorships because they were very happy with the dictators. So I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm talking they have, about the public they have opinion. Changed. I mean, now in the public opinion, in the yes. public opinion, of course there is a big change, and there is a big change because because uh, because people for the first time felt that there is something which comes outside the dominant, the dominant discourse about the Arabs. And this is why uh, there were sit-ins in Spain, from Spain to Wall Street, uh, 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 with Medan al tahrir uh, uh, as a mother, which is, which, which is something, something very totally new. And I think this will open the, the, the possibility of a real dialogue, and, uh, which we, both of us, needed a real dialogue about about our destiny and about our relationships and about the concept of peace in the region and the concept of stability in the region. Stability in the region and peace in the region must be based upon justice. Now they have to hear us. We are not dictators who are playing games. We are uh, peoples who are in a, revolution, in a revolutionary process and we need respect and justice. Ab upon the spaces, things Ilias, will change. Ilyas, if in change. front of you would be Hillary Clinton sitting there, and you are, oh my God. believe me, you are prettier, <laughs> and Barack Obama, what would you tell them about, what is, would be your, your strategy, how to deal with the new Middle East today? I, I will tell Barack Obama that uh, when he was elected, I was very enthusiastic for him, and I worked in his campaign, and actually, unfortunately, he disappointed us. Hopefully, in the new elections after that, he will try not to disappoint us so much. Would you rather see Romney? Uh, uh, no, of course, of course, of course. Point. Nobody would rather see Romney at all. This is what I said. <laughs> this is what I said after the election. Supposedly, I'm presupposing that hopefully Obama will be re-elected. Okay? okay. So hopefully, he will not disappoint us that much. The, the second thing I will tell them: you have to to listen to the people. Listen to the people. Listen to the to the to the to the uh, 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 to the 
the public opinion in the Arab world, there is a public opinion, there is diversity, we are not one block, we are like all peoples of the world, we have different opinions, and there is a social uh, 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 movement which is going on, you have to hear it, and you have to communicate with it, and we want to be friends. But be sure that our dignity is respected. We made all these revolutions against these dictators because we needed dignity. Our dignity is respected and justice in the region is respected. And the Palestinians, it's time for these people to have an independent state. Without this, nothing will work. Thank you, Elias. I would like to ask Muna actually something about a different argument about sex. And um, obviously, you're right about one point. All conservatives in the world are obsessed with that. And even the media, let's be honest. I mean, the, the, we have a country where, and I said it last night, that impeached um, President Clinton because he lied about having an affair and never prosecuted President Bush that lied about the Iraqi war. Uh, this big case with the uh, with um, secure, Secret Service and the hookers in Colombia and other and on many other cases, and then the way the way they talked about uh, women during the Republic campaign, it seems to me and sounded to me that there's something there's a lot of similarity between them and the Tunisians, Islamist groups, Egyptians maybe. What is what did we do as women? I mean, what's the matter with us that we we are threatening? I mean, what is happening there? You know, I spoke at a rally in New York on Saturday, this past Saturday. It was a rally against the war on women, the Republican-led war, war on women. And I started by saying, I'm an Egyptian, I'm also an American, I'm a feminist, I'm a Muslim, I tell the Muslim Brotherhood, I tell the Christian Brotherhood, stay out of my vagina unless I want you in there. And this is something that they don't understand. And I think that there's been a global movement, basically, towards conservatism in so many parts of the world. It's, it's this, the pendulum over the past few years has swung steadily and increasingly towards the right, where it becomes acceptable in the year 2012 in the United States to actually talk seriously about revoking or repeat, um, taking, rolling back basically Roe v. Wade and seriously discussing a woman's right to access to contraception. And where in Egypt, there's serious discussion about lowering the age at which a girl can get married to 14. And where in Israel, they want to put women at the back of the bus and there's certain neighborhoods in Jerusalem that are ultra-Orthodox where I could get stoned or spat at for being, for being dressed like this. So it's a global, and not just the, 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 the monotheistic religions, but the monotheistic religions especially have a very paternalistic, misogynistic streak. But if you take it globally, there has been a, a steady move <coughs> towards this right-wing conservative attitude that obsesses over women and obsesses over sex. And when you take that to the ground in the revolutions, one of the things that we have to reckon with is the reality in Egypt, for example, of the fact that so many young people can't afford to get married. And they're having sex without waiting to get, to get married. Mm -hmm. And they're told that it's a sin. And they're told that they shouldn't be doing it, but it's happening anyway. So how are we going to reckon with the reality on the ground of a generation that has stood up and inspired so many others in Egypt to say, I will hold everyone accountable that, is, that has been held accountable by society for so long, and its basic needs have been denied. How in a country like Tunisia, that actually allowed, gave women the right to an abortion 10 years before France, how in a country like Tunisia, that has such a progressive record for women, how is a Nahda, their Islamist party, going to reckon with that? So far they've said we're not going to interfere with things in the constitution that guarantee equality between men and women. But Tunisian women are worried, because at the end of the day, it always does come down to sex, because women, essentially, we are the vectors of culture. Our wombs are the conveyor belts of the future. And so whoever controls us and our wombs feels that they control everything. And so my struggle, now, when I talk in the United States, I make these connections so that you can, you can see what's happening here and understand clearly that misogyny is not limited to just one part of the world. But when I wrote this essay, and, and clearly at the heart of this essay is sex, and the control of sexuality. I wanted to, con to focus on the Arab region because it's where I'm from and it's a region that I care about deeply. But it's a region where I believe we, we've begun the political revolution and that is removing the Mubarak in the presidency. The regime isn't fully gone yet. 
But my contention again and again is unless we remove the Mubarak in our mind and the Mubarak in our bedroom and the Mubarak in the street and begin thereby the social revolution, we will not have achieved a political revolution and a political revolution will fail because you can't have a revolution. And Elias said it and I totally agree. Women, we are the canaries in that coal mine. If our rights are doing well, everybody is doing well. In cultures where, or societies where women's rights and, and they're so intertwined with sex, are not doing well, then minorities are not doing well, ethnic minorities, religious minorities. So sex is at the heart of it because of this need to control female sexuality because of the future. But I think in the region, because of this wave of honesty and accountability, you will find greater discussion sooner or later about sexuality, about being different, about the LGBT community, about young people who, if they can go on the street and get rid of Mubarak, then they will take those, those taboos and turn them upside down. Mona, do you think there is a full image of what's going on in Egypt and in the Arab world and this desire for accountability and honesty? It's, uh, is it clear to the no. US audience? No, because the US okay, audience... Have been restriction. No, no, because no. The, the, the attention span is five minutes. If you turn on TV right now, you don't see anything about the revolutions and the fight continues. Now, this is an election year, so the attention spans are even shorter. But I don't think this wonderful and beautiful diversity of voices I mean, I remember soon after Mubarak was forced to step down, this young Arab on Twitter came on and he said, hello, I'm an Arab and we got rid of two dictators in two months. Mm -hmm. This amazing sense of pride, despite the fact that things are difficult right now, but what revolution isn't difficult? This amazing sense of pride and, and this abundance of voices, you are not hearing. You really aren't, and it's a real shame that you're not hearing it. It's a very beautiful conversation. I would like to open actually the floor for three questions. Just three questions, and I have actually three, and I have a microphone there, so I would start with the ladies. Forgive me for that. Uh, yes, please. There's a microphone in the end of this room there. And please, questions, not long <coughs> comments. Actually, how, uh, the aid, the humanitarian aid folks were put in prison and yes. almost not let out. How do you, uh, how does one help the, the diversity, the beautiful group that, that revolted, uh, including the women in it, how do you help them create themselves into a system that can be a source of change, not just a dazzler, but a real solid source of change? How to help civil society. Uh, yeah, okay. You know, I'm reminded by something that a producer told me the other day. I was on the Melissa Harris Perry show and, and we were discussing my essay and, and Professor Leila Ahmed came on to discuss it with me as a counter argument. And this was a, a young African American producer and he said to me, Malcolm X spoke at a university sometime in the 1960s and a, a very earnest young Caucasian woman came up to him and said to him, I'm very concerned about what's happening to the Negroes in the United States. This is the language of the past, yeah? How can I help you as someone who fully is on your side? And he said to her, don't do anything. Do nothing. But Honestly. You. No, no, this is how you help. This is how you help us, whether it's me or the people on the ground or the people who move back and forth. You pressure the administration. You can't do anything for the people on the ground. This is our fight. We will fight it. That's why I joked you, don't go to the Ministry of Defense. This is our fight. You pressure the administration. Because one of the things that is being used against the NGO workers in Egypt right now is that they get money from abroad to, to ruin Egypt. So don't, don't do anything. Focus on the administration. I actually asked what you're going to do. What am I going to do? Oh, I, I go back to Egypt almost four to, every four to six weeks. I try my best when I'm over there to fight the way that I see, that I can fight, and that is to join all the street movements that I can find, but, but my, my primary identity is as a writer. And as a writer, it's my duty to poke the painful places. So I poke the painful places back there, I poke the painful places here. So that's how I contribute. But because I move back and forth, it's also, I'm obliged to bring some of those voices from there to you and amplify those voices because you don't hear them. And that's why I urge you to pressure the administration because the administration doesn't hear them either. So for me as an Egyptian American, I work over there, I work over here. But for you Americans who are interested in support and are allies of our revolution, do nothing for Egypt internally, but pressure the administration because that's where you can help. Yes, please. And also after him. Oh. 
Nigel through the name, you see. I recognize him, yes. I saw you on TV yesterday. <laughs> Hello. How, how are you again? <laughs> Ali, right? Yes. Hello, Ali. How are you, Mona? Alhamdulillah. Wonderful. So I have a question to the panel. I want to get your thoughts on um, the role of petrol dollars in, um, in this transition period and the sort of like how it plays a role in the political arena. The reason I ask this is that, like when you think about the 1950s in the United States, how communism was seen as this existential threat to the state and to Western European capitalist systems and so on. And you think Karl Marx, you know, his writings have been around for 100 years, so it's not like there was nothing new in the ideology that was there, but the difference was in the 1950s, you had you know, the Ministry of Propaganda and Culture in the Soviet Union, as well as the Ministry of Defense, funding all these movements across Latin America, across the world, really, that promoted communism, and so in a way acted as a cultural propagation of that ideology. Today, communism is not seen as a central threat only because the, the source of funding has disappeared, the Soviet Union. And I'm wondering, given that, um, you know, the, the, since the, the, um, the sort of like spike in, in oil prices in the 70s um, and what it meant to the rise of Islamism, you know, where like something like um, Saikot's writings had existed since the 1950s, but only since the 70s and 80s you saw its propagation everywhere from Afghanistan to Egypt. And given that oil worked around for another, you know, at least 100 years, I'm wondering what, how do we, um, how do we counter that, that funding issue where you're, you know, David and Goliath of sorts in, in that power structure? Let's start with, yeah. Uh, it's a very interesting question, but uh, uh, before I answer, uh, one, one major thing, these uh, countries, Saudi Arabia or the Gulf, are the uh, Qatar, uh, Emirates, whatever, whatever are the best allies of the United States, the best allies. And, uh, and uh, the second thing, this petrodollar was used very much in the last battle against communism. I mean, this alliance between the Saudis, the Pakistanis, and the CIA uh, uh, in the war inside, inside Afghanistan was a major, was one of the, was the last battle against communism, which made the whole thing collapse afterwards. So this was part of, of, of this is part of a camp which, which played a, a, a big role now. This camp uh, had uh, phenomena like Bin Laden which disturbed everything in, in, in this madness of terrorism and so on and so forth. But things calmed down now and the alliance is back. So <laughs> for us in the Arab world now, for us, I think, I think this is a major, the major challenge in the sense that it is, they, they, uh, they control all the uh, televisions, all the media, all the newspapers, the Pan-Arab newspapers are totally controlled by, by, by the Gulf states and they promote all the time their own ideology which is, which is on the right of the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, the Wahhabism, they don't like the Muslim Brotherhood, by the way, because they think the Muslim Brotherhood are not real Muslims. Uh, uh, so, uh, and they promote this, and, and they played a major role first, thinking that they could help Mubarak till the end. Not only the Israelis uh, were, were sad for Mubarak, the Saudis were also very sad for Mubarak, and, and now they are trying to contain the whole Arab Spring, uh, uh, and, and, and when they feel that they cannot contain it, they create problems like the, lately, the problem created in Egypt. <coughs> I mean, uh, when this Egyptian human rights uh, 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 activist was imprisoned in Saudi Arabia, and then there was this reaction in the streets of Cairo against the Saudi embassy, and then the embassy is closed, all the consulates are closed, and they are threatening to throw all the uh, uh, Egyptian workers from Saudi Arabia, which will create a big economic problem in Egypt. So they use all their power to control the, the democratic mechanism because they are against <coughs> democracy. So the next battle, uh, and, and then the last thing, uh, uh, you know, the Saudis became the leaders of the Arab world after Egypt was totally marginalized. And Egypt was marginalized after the Camp David process and, and, and after it went out of the Arab, of, 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 of the, 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 the Arab consensus, and, and then the degradation of the status of Egypt became so big to the extent that a tiny country like Qatar, whose population is 100,000, is more important than Egypt now in the, in the, in the regional and international politics.
Damascus, Beirut, uh, and not, not, uh, not the, the, the city of salts, as they were described by the great Saudi writer Abdul Rahman Munir. Uh, uh, and, and I think the battle here is a very, is a very, is a major battle on both cultural and political and political levels. So uh, now on the on the uh, uh, this huge money, which actually actually this money this money is uh, uh, you know in the, in the in the golden days of the Arab uh, of of the Arab national movement, there was that slogan uh, everywhere in the Arab world, which was the oil of the Arabs for the Arabs. That is, all this wealth must be must be uh, used for for uh, for development in the Arab world. Now, all this wealth is used to make the uh, the World Cup, for example, in Qatar will be the World Cup in 2020, and it will cost the Qataris something like 20 billion dollars. Can you imagine this amount of money if it was used to build uh, to build factories in Egypt? Well, actually, last night they bought uh, the screen. Uh, which is a beautiful mm. painting for $120 million. Mm. Three weeks ago, they bought another painting, a uh, Cezanne like painting, the, like the, card, the card players, for $250 million. So they're investing, I guess, in some kind of culture. They are the culture. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, they want... For they museum want, museum no, 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 no. Actually, actually they, want, they want the culture to exist no more. And this is the big threat, then, if you analyze it, in, in the interior situation of the Arab world. The big threat is that they dominate production, for example, movie or television productions, and 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 the place where these productions are done, which is Egypt, mainly Egypt, and then Syria and Tunisia and then Lebanon, they are totally now dependent on this money, which is a big uh, challenge to the freedom of expression. So the, the the battle is there, and it is mainly a battle inside the Arab world. Not, not an international battle, because I think the, uh, 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 the European uh, 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 or the, um, the Americans, I don't think they are interested in that as much as they, they feel that their interests are, are, are safeguarded in these places, and there is nothing to threaten them. And actually, they have their big military base, for example. The biggest American military base is in Qatar. It's not any, uh, uh, and, you know, and, and we know we know how, and now, and now the way they are uh, building uh, up the military in, uh, in the Emirates and in Saudi Arabia, spending all this money for countries that do not have population to have armies. I don't know what, what, how they can use these, uh, these very sophisticated aeroplanes. In, in some of these Emirates, the army is Pakistanis and Germans. I don't know why Germans, but, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, are Germans. And, and the whole issue is to control the population, which is uh, which they are afraid from. So I think this phase of the Arab Revolution will be coming, and it will be the most dangerous, the most interesting phase. But first, let's hope that Egypt will come out from uh, from this process with a democratic. Uh, with I a think democratic Egypt will solution. set up an example, and, and other countries will follow. And, but I, I don't think anybody can stop it. Please, last question. We're all exhilarated, I'm sure, as Americans to see change in the Arab world. Um, words, words do have meaning. It's curious. Good literature is liberating. Um, I wonder if the whole use of the term Arab Spring hasn't been a misnomer. The use of that, the word the Arab Spring, Arab if it wasn't. Yeah, yeah. Has really, hasn't it been really an overstatement? Overstatement? Given, given that for example, with focus to Egypt, what really has happened here is just a military push. Mm, no, see, I agree with you that it's a misnomer, but not because it was a, an overstatement. I, first, I, I have a lot of problems with the term Arab Spring. First of all, not, a, not everybody in the region is an Arab. When you look at Egypt, for example, we have Nubians, we have Amazigh close to, in the Western Desert, close to the border with Libya. When you look at Tunisia and the various ethnic groups that are rising up there, when you look at Syria, not everybody in the region identifies as an Arab, and I think that it, it, it ends up marginalizing a lot of the people who identify in other ways. And one of the most interesting thing, things that have been happening during these revolutions is, for example, I'm seeing my friends on the ground who are saying, I'm Egyptian and Nubian. I'm Egyptian and gay. I'm Egyptian and feminist. 
or the, all these multiple identities that were suppressed and suffocated by so many regimes that told you there was only one way to be Egyptian. And that speaks to the diversity. So I think Arab uh, forgot all those other groups that have been part of these revolutions. But spring, spring has been really, really a disastrous way, way of basically anticipating any problem that happens. So people can say the Arab winter. I, you know, no, no colors, no fruits, no seasons, none of those. Just call it a revolution. Why does it have to be a spring? Why does it have to be jasmine? Why does it have to be, I don't know, falafel sandwich revolution? None of those. It's a revolution of courage and for freedom and dignity. No, falafel is good. <laughs> but but, but, yes, like, no, yeah. but can, I, can I just, just one thing, just uh, Arab is part of this identity. Of course, and, and what is, only. No, no, of course. And what is very interesting, we have seen in, this, in these revolutions, and this is something we have never seen in the history of, of the region, that there was one slogan from Tunisia yes. to Bahrain to Cairo. And this slogan was for the first time in our history in the demonstrations in classical Arabic, not in colloquial Arabic. Mm -hmm. And it was based upon a poem by a Tunisian poet who wrote it in 1920, Abu Qasim al And the slogan was, the people want uh, to topple the regime. Topple so, and it was one slogan in classic, we never, I've been in demonstrations since I was 15, we never had slogans in classical Arabic. This is the first time. So there is a kind of, of feeling that this is a region, the Arab world is a region, but uh, as a region doesn't mean we have one revolution, revolution, we have revolutions and not revolution. And in this Arab, Arabic identity, we are reinventing ourselves to understand this Arab identity as a multiple identity. We have to accept that in our identity there are many layers, and when you have only one identity, you are a fascist anyway. <laughs> and, uh, there is not, no one who has one identity except if he is a fascist or she is a fascist. And, and, and we are discovering that these diversities of identity are creating, I think, in the Arab uh, political life in the Arab culture, something profoundly new. Mm -hmm. And we have to understand it, depict it, write it, as because we are uh, 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 only writers and we don't know Actually, anything Actually, 20 years ago, 1987, uh, there was something that happened in the West Bank, Jer is Jerusalem and Gaza, and it was called Intifada, which mm -hmm. is, everybody thought that it was a revolution, but it was uh, a popular movement and the meaning in Tifal is stand up straight, and it was calling for dignity and freedom and liberty. Do you think in somehow that left a sign in the Arab world? You know, it's, it's really interesting that you bring that up, and what we were talking about earlier about Israel and Palestine. It was a peaceful one. I remember, yes. you know, in the end, people were throwing stones at the, at the tanks, but it was peaceful. We, we've come full circle, because in 1987, you saw young Palestinians who stood up to Israeli soldiers sometimes using their catapult, I don't know what they're called in, in American English, but you know those slingshots, slingshots. thank you. Uh, sometimes not, and it was young men and women, unlike the second intifada, which was, which was much more of a male-dominated uh, affair, but that first intifada, so in 1987, and now, you're seeing young Palestinians, I know young Palestinians in Gaza, especially, who are looking at what's happening in the region now, being reminded of 1987 and being inspired all over again by what's happening and recognizing that they have multiple layers of revolution but being inspired to go out and, and do those multiple layers of revolution. So a revolution against Hamas and its fundamentalism and extremism, a revolution against the Palestinian Authority and its corruption, and a revolution against Israel and its occupation. So when you look at the region, you see this kind of very, very lovely circle because the Palestinians are then reminded of their own into Father revolution, revolution and how it inspired the region and now how the region is inspiring them, which is also by way of saying that there is no way that any part of the region is not being inspired. The Gulf is being inspired, even if you don't see anything right now, because all the leaders in the Gulf are basically numbing their, their citizens with money. Every Saudi and every Qatari and every Kuwaiti is watching these revolutions and is being inspired. Every Palestinian is being inspired. Even the Israelis were inspired when they had their tent movement, yeah. even though they didn't completely connect it with occupation. Because mm -hmm. if you talk about social justice, you cannot ignore occupation. So everybody in the region is being inspired. 
and, and the entire world. I mean, one of the things that I'm so excited about what's happening is because I believe what's happening in the region is fundamentally changing the relationship between us, the citizens, and the people who claim to represent us. And so that germ, that, that blossom of inspiration, when it goes to Spain and it meets the indignaces, I think they're called, they, they're telling their representatives, you don't re represent me in the way that I want you to represent me. It lands in Wall Street and it, the Occupy movement is saying, this money and politics doesn't represent me. So essentially, this is a moment in human history where we stand and tell those who claim to represent us, you don't represent me in the way I want you to. But then ultimately, you ask yourselves, you, each one of you, what are you going to do about it? Because if you're seeing people in the region stand up to tanks and dictators and pay the price, the ultimate price, to be represented in the way they demand, because the people demand to be represented in this way, what will you do in all the comfort and privilege you live in to ensure that you are represented. This is why we are standing at a, a moment of world-changing history. This is a seismic shift that 20 years from now we will look back and say, that region changed the entire world. I'm sorry, uh, as for politeness, I have one last question. I said three, but there's four. Please. <coughs> uh, do you think that the, <coughs> that the term Arab Spring is used because possibly because the international community and the international media cannot deal with the word revolution. Beautiful mm. question. Very good question. And that, and that we are basically in denial because we like to identify with something that's good. Like yeah. <laughs> it's a beautiful question. The question and is if you, clear. If you use the word revolution, to speak you to put the mic, a then. very different tenor on what's What's going on? I need a quick answer, but I repeat answer. the question. He said that if the he Arab uh, Spring uh, was used by the West and the media because they cannot handle the word revolution because they are in denial about it. Quick answer? No, but he, he gave the answer. It's true. Yes. What, you have said, you repeat it? What, what, what you have said is true. Uh, they, cannot, uh, they don't want to identify with a term like revolution, so they prefer a mild term like the Spring which reminds us uh, them of the spring of Prague uh, 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 20 years, some 20, 30 years ago, 1968, 40 years ago, uh, uh, which reminds of the spring of Prague. But, uh, and using the term revolution means that, that you have to, 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 also you have to change. I mean, if you deal with a revolution situation, also you must be able, you must be open for change in mentality, for change in ways of dealing, which I don't think uh, uh, the Western countries are yet, or the Western governments, let's be say, are, 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 are ready for that because they are still the prisoners of this, uh, uh, of this uh, scheme of interests related to the oil of the earth. So the Arab world is the oil, the, the oil interest mainly, and stability regarding two things, regarding the oil and Israel, and that's all. And all the other issues are not, are not a pri pri priority or a Yes. Well, a last word to Mona. Very quickly, and, and to tie it into things that have been happening in the region for a while now, because clearly these revolutions didn't happen overnight. We didn't suddenly wake up and say, God, this is really bad. We have to get rid of our dictator. It's been happening for a while. But one of the, one of the most poignant things that a, an Iranian friend of mine said about the Green Movement, for example, in 2009, was for the first time in the lives of many Iranians, they were determining the image of them that you got to see. Because they were on the street holding their smartphones, taking pictures and broadcasting them all over the world. Whereas in the past, the image, the narrative of Iran was always the woman in a chador or Ahmadinejad looking like a lunatic. Always. Not looking. It's <laughs> <laughs> when you see the pictures. You know, he would land in New York and you get evil has landed. So that was the narrative of Iran. The woman in Chador or Ahmadinejad. But then you had all these Iranians on the street saying, no, we are Iran. That's not our narrative. So essentially what's happening in the region right now is we are telling our narrative, finally. Yeah. And the world is finally listening. Again, the administrations are having a hard time catching up. Again, the theorists and the academics and the think tanks, no insult to any senior citizen who is of Caucasian background here. But all the think tanks in the United States are old white men who told a certain narrative about our part of the world, which was clearly a failed narrative. And so we finally are telling our own stories. And this is where the role of writers and cultural and, and artists and bloggers and filmmakers and anybody who uses 
the most effective and po potent weapons, peaceful, non-violent weapons, are essentially what we're saying is we have a story that you have not heard for such a long time because you had a narrative already set for us. We are now taking back that narrative and telling you the story that we want the world to know of ourselves. This is why this time is the most exciting time of our lives. Question. And the story of this country is actually starts now and you're all protagonists in that. And in November, whoever will not go to vote doesn't have to complain about the outcome of that. So I'm inviting you all to vote because this is a privilege. When Barack Obama spoke at the Cairo University, I think all of us were inspired because we thought, God, he's, he has dark skin like most of us. His father was Muslim like most of us, and he can be the president of his country, and we can't even vote. So this is a, one of the most beautiful privileges in the world to go to vote and um, think about the next generation. Thank you very much for being us. Awesome.